Okay, I think we're ready to go. All right. So like I said, today we are going to be covering um, the transaction processing. So um, I know at um, the OISIN United Conference, we were talking about you know, the training sessions and things like that, and um, just the whole terminology of things and getting familiar with um, the software applications. And um, I know with inventory, there's a lot of you know, different verbiage. Um, and it's basically just not so much software verbiage, but just fixed assets verbiage in general, right? Because you've got depreciation, you've got, you know, acquisitions and stuff like that. So I will try to, you know, go through those in a little more detail with you guys um, today, um, just to get you a little more comfortable with just fixed assets in general, and also how it's being used in the software. Okay. Um, so before we actually dive into the actual transaction processing programs, I wanted to take a step back here and talk about the core setup. So when you access the inventory um, application, your first menu is the core menu. And um, processing depends on what's been set up underneath core. So um, I have links here to the documentation in each one of these. Um, but the codes are have to be defined um, before you start processing in the transactions menu. Um, so we're going to talk about we're just going to touch upon a couple of those because once you add one in one you know code, it's pretty much the same in the rest um, of the options. But we'll also dig into the configuration in the fiscal years as well and just touch upon those. Um, so before um, we do anything more with this PowerPoint, let's dig into the core menu and take a look at that. And if you hear a dog snoring in the background, <laughs> um, you'll know what that noise is. So he's small, but he can snore. <laughs> um, okay. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the core menu. I'm logged into my inventory application. And um, what I'm going to take you through first is the actual asset uh, classes. And so the main core options are asset classes, um, which defines the actual asset that the item is being used for. Is this a fixture, furniture, and equipment type act of asset? Is it a building? Is it a vehicle? So those are the different asset classes, and those are defined um, the first two digits anyway, are defined by um, uh, the state. And then um, the last two digits can be defined by the district. And so here are the actual ones that we have in our um, sample data here. And so you'll see that most of these have been defined um, by the actual um, First two digits, you know, land and improvements, buildings, um, fixture furniture and equipment. You'll notice this one is also fixture furniture and equipment, but they defined it even more so. So they must have like a subset that they wanted to define with the 51 and like the 61. So these are what the asset classes look like. So they're basically when your districts migrated over from classic, all of this information moved over with them. This all migrated over. And so obviously, if the district is going to want to set up a new asset class, they can by going in and clicking on create, and it will allow them then to go in and create a new type. And so you'll see the same thing with the others as well. Category codes. These are the item categories. So in here, um, they can go in and enter in these codes a description and then you'll see some other information in here as well. So again, this all migrated over from the classic data. And um, then they can go in and enter any of this other information. Um, and I just want to give you a little tip here when it comes to the category codes is that um, when you have like the useful life and the asset class entered in here, when you go in to actually add an item, those will be filled in automatically. So if I'm going to um, use this category code, maybe I got some playground equipment 
and I enter in this category code of 8001, if I have a useful life in here already of let's say 10 years, and I have an asset class that's related to this, probably you know, fixtures, furniture, and equipment. So I have an 0300 here. What happens then is when I go in and add an item and I select this category code, it will go out there and already fill in the useful life and the asset class fields on the item. So um, that's helpful. It's just one less thing that they have to worry about. Um, obviously, if they go in here then maybe later, and let's say they change the playground useful life to five years, um, it's not gonna go to all those related items that have that category code and automatically update them. It's just you know starting from, from new here is what it's doing. So same thing with asset class, if I go in, and I change this from 0300 to 0200, it's not gonna go out to, to those existing items that have that category code and automatically update them with the new asset class. So um, that's just another thing to keep in mind, but I believe it is helpful for them to pre-fill these in here. Um, that way then when they go in to add, add those items, those fields are already filled in. Okay. Um, just some of the other things that we're seeing in here. Um, condition is, you know, the state, is it in good condition, fair, poor? Um, those are things that the district can um, enter in. Disposition codes, these are needed when they need to create a disposition transaction. So they go in um, the item. I got a question here. If you can find all the items with that asset class, can they re calculate life to date depreciation to get it to update. I will answer that question a little bit later, Tammy, but, um, but yes, um, if they go in and find those items with that asset class, um, they can go in um, and if you're saying like mass, they can go in and, and check box on the item grid, those particular ones, and then filter, check those all, and then there's a depreciate option that will recalculate like to date. So, but I will um, touch upon that definitely uh, Friday. Um, and when I go through depreciation. Uh, so, um, configuration, we'll get into a little bit here and a little bit later. Uh, disposition codes, like I said, you go in and create a disposition transaction underneath the transactions, um, you create a disposition, it needs a disposition code. Those codes, like how is it disposed of? Was it sold? Was it destroyed? Um, and so it's, um, you need to define those underneath the disposition codes in here. Um, we'll get into fiscal years here in a little bit. Um, the function and the funds, so these are the actual uh, function codes and uh, the descriptions. And so again, these are needed when you create an item. So when you're creating an item, it's gonna ask for the function code that the item's being used for. So is this something that's being used in the maintenance uh, department? Um, then you have to set up a particular function code for the maintenance department. And you can use the HUSAS function codes. Um, if you wanna keep it, you know, in sync with um, USAS, you can put in, you know, 2,700 for um, maintenance. Um, but um, again, these all carried over from Classic. Same thing with the funds. So these are the funds that the um, item is being used for. And so again, my data is scrambled, <laughs> so anonymized. So you're gonna see some weird descriptions and stuff in here, just giving you a heads up. Um, but uh, you'll see that it's got an actual description and it's got a type. These are um, required as well. So is this a governmental type fund, a proprietary or fiduciary? Those are the three types. So these are all explained in more detail in the documentation. Um, but again, these all got pulled over from migration. Um, location codes, where are these items located? So just one thing I wanna note with location codes is that you're going to have a category and a number. Now, one thing with these grids is that you can move these things around. By default, the category is always off to the right. So I always move it over to the left um, because I'm, I was a classic user. And so I like to see the category and then the actual room number 
and then the description. So once I move them and you know move them around by just holding down on it and sliding it uh, left to right, it'll stick then and it'll stay that way. Um, and you know works very similar to what you see in in Recess and Payroll. Um, so obviously, if they have a new location and they want to go in and create that, they can create it manually. Um, they can also go in if they need to. Um, and let's say they want to go in and they've got a spreadsheet with a bunch of new location codes um, that they want to enter in. Um, they can go in and import those in too. There's a system option underneath import and import on uh, new location codes if they wanted to. Um, so a lot of these core options have an actual system import option. I'll just click on that real quick just to show you where they can go in and import certain codes. Anything with where you see a code behind it is related to the core menu. So we will get into the imports um, tomorrow, definitely when we go through, or I'm sorry, later today when we go through the import options. Um, but that's what those are for, allowing you to go in and mass import codes. Um, that's probably more useful for a district that is starting new in inventory that didn't migrate over and they do have um, some codes that they want to mass import, they can do that. Um, and one other thing I will talk further about when we get into imports is how if you go in and import spreadsheets of like transaction data and those codes do not already exist out here underneath core, they'll get imported in and get created in the core menu. Um, now, when they come in, they'll come in with a just a description of like user defined, but they will definitely be imported in. And then what you can do is go into that particular one and let me go back into like location codes. So they'll get imported in via that spreadsheet. Um, but because you used an item spreadsheet to import items, the location code didn't exist. So it's going to create it automatically then the description though is going to say something like user imported or something like that. So you will then, you, what you can do then is go in to this actual location code, export these out, change the description, update it to what they really should be, and then go back into system, import and select the location and update those existing location codes with the updated description. Um, so um, those are just, different you know, things. I know I'm kind of branching off, but while we're in here, I just kind of wanted to tell you about those things. Um, organization codes is maybe more of like different department or areas. Um, I kind of relate them to an OPU um, in USAS. And so those contain the actual areas. So if they do want to run reports by an organization code or filter on the grid, um, stuff like that, um, then um, those are things that uh, they can um, have those. If, if it was in classic, it migrated over, and then they can do those same things here in inventory. Okay, so those are kind of just a brief description of the actual codes. Now, while I'm in core here, I do want to touch upon a couple other ones that aren't so much codes, but just setup information. And so the first thing I want to hit is the configuration. And so with configuration, let me go back to my, I don't think I have anything. Nope. So this is the configuration screen that's sitting out here. And so for those of you that were used to classic, this is kind of the somewhat the replacement of that screen in uh, classic. And so in here, it's going to list the information about um, the district, their name, IRN, um, last fiscal year closed. So um, I am in fiscal year 2023, and that's because I've set um, 2023 to be my current year. Um, I closed out 2022. So when that happens, it's going to automatically update this last closed fiscal year to the year that I've closed. So this is always 
the last closed year, not the current year um, that I'm in. So when I look at this, I know then that I must be in fiscal year or fiscal year 22 has definitely been closed um, and that I'm currently in fiscal year 23. Um, this information down here regarding the report bundle, um, this is if the report bundles have been set up. Report bundles, we only have one, the fiscal year end report bundle, and that gets generated when they close a year. Um, if, so when the report bundle gets generated, it creates a zip uh, file of all the reports. And I think there's like 26 of them that get generated. And then those um, can be emailed to the treasurer or ITC person, whoever needs access to that, th those zipped reports. And so those email addresses can be put in here. So there is some initial setup with this. Um, and uh, that information is um, in the documentation. Um, we have an actual chapter on the fiscal year end report bundle and it will take you to all of that and tell you what needs to be set up. But you know, in order to email, there needs to be some email configuration done through the system configuration option. And then also those email addresses need to be put in here. Um, so that's what that field's for. Um, the foundation. Now the foundation right now is just an informational field. It's not doing anything. Um, there are no, um, insurance value reports in inventory for that to be run off of. Um, um, so basically, you know, if you had a certain percentage listed in classic that migrated over. So if you maybe said 2% of um, the foundations need to be excluded, um, what you can do is you can manually make those change updates by going in and um, like I said, this is just informational. So if I put 2% here, but I actually wanted to try and calculate that, um, you would have to go into those building um, items on the items grid, filter by those buildings and go in and, and extract that data out and do a manual calculation in Excel um, to get the 2% off um, if this is something that you need for insurance purposes. Um, so no type of behind the scenes calculation with this field. It's just informational. Um, tag numbers, you can uh, set this up to auto-populate tag numbers. Um, some districts do, a lot of them don't. Um, they have a certain set of tags that they have, um, maybe even physical stickers of tags, um, and they don't want it to pre-populate the next tag number. They wanna be able to actually enter that tag number in. So. If they want to be able to have a little more control over the tag number, they can leave that unchecked. Um, the gap flag. So this isn't anything that they can change. What directs this or, che or checks marks this uh, field is this um, option up here, enable or disable the gap flag. If their gap flag was set, um, to yes in classic, it's going to be migrated over as enabled so that they're still on gap. Now, when we go into all of these transaction process, uh, processing programs today, um, this is going to be a district that I'm going to be using that is that does have their gap flag ena enabled, obviously, uh, because it says disable um, gap flag, um, that's going to turn off gap. Um, but um, so, and then it would show enable gap and then I'd have to click that to enable gap again. Um, but, you know, most of, you know, the districts I've worked with in most of the districts that we've had questions coming in, um, a lot of them have their gap flag enabled. So that's why I'm gonna approach this training with the gap flag enabled. Um, but if this is a district Um, this is a district that, um, like I said, has our gap flag set. And so that's how we're going to approach it with the training. Do you have a question here? Does it matter when the gap flag is set when starting with the blank configuration? Like before or after we load the items? That's a great question, Sharon. Um, it should be set before you start loading items. 
Um, and that is all outlined in that migrant or that non-migration steps. It shows the steps of what needs to be done. Um, and the gap flag is one thing that needs to be taken care of before you actually um, start loading items. The gap flag, your threshold and things like that. So that once those items get loaded in, they know which ones are to be capitalized and which ones aren't based on your gap flag and your cap threshold. <clears throat> um, the uh, using USAS function codes, I believe I asked about this one because I wasn't 100% sure, but I believe that right now, this is informational too um, at this point. It's just basically saying that your, your function code setup in here is similar to what you have set up in USAS. And again, if you migrated over, um, whatever you had set up in Classic is going to be populated in here. So at this point, this doesn't do anything doesn't have any bearing on any other programs. It's just an informational setting. And then using receive date is looking. Um, that is um, something that you can set up. So basically what that means is that if you are using the pending file, okay, and you're bringing those invoiced items over into the pending file, do you want, and we, when you're ready to create a tag, for that pending item, do you want it to use the invoice date or the receive date that was stored on that um, invoice? And so if you want it to use the receive date, then by checking that, it's gonna look at that and that will become the acquisition date of the item. So again, this is all detailed in the um, configuration chapter underneath core, um, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys um, just a, a brief overview of, of this, just because a lot of this does affect it uh, when you're actually going into process. So, you know, it's going to look, what's the last year closed? Um, is it, you know, do we have to auto-populate um, our tag numbers? Do we want to do that? Do we want to use the receive date? So it's, it is looking at this. It is looking to see if the gap flag is enabled. Um, so those things are important and need to be set up ahead of time. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the, is the fiscal years. And so in this example here, sample bill has been on for a couple of years now. And so let's just talk about what we're seeing here on this grid. And so I'm going down to the last one here first, 2021. So this is just basically telling me what fiscal year that was. And so this district must have migrated over. Um, when their data was still in 2021 from EIS. So when you migrate it, when you migrate over, it looks at the current year that you're in classic and it creates that as the fiscal year um, automatically in inventory. Um, so that's what happened here. Um, and then it also just you know gives you more informational that 2021 start date is July 1st through June 30th. And then it also gives you the dollar and life limits that were set up. Now, again, it's looking at classic and what was your configuration data in that screen. So if you're, yeah, your, I'm sorry, your capitalization criteria in that screen, um, you had a dollar limit and a life limit there. So that migrated over here. And so um, in this particular case here, um, it's $5,000 basically is your cap threshold. There is no life limit set. So when you go in to create an item, if that acquisition amount is $5,000 or greater, then that item is going to be a capitalized asset. And so those capitalized assets are going to be reported on your gap schedules because we have our gap flag enabled here. Um, now, if there was a dollar limit and a life limit. So let's say it was 5,000 in five years. You enter an item, it has to meet both in order to be capitalized. So if your item is 5,000, but your life limit is zero, it's not going to be um, capitalized because the life limit in here, for example, is five years. So it has to be 5,000 and five years in order for that item to be considered capitalized. 
we do get questions about that. Why isn't this item showing as capitalized and stuff like that? Um, and it could be because there is no life limit. So once you go in and edit that item and enter in the life limit, then it will change the status to capitalize. And that item then will show up on your GAP reports. Um, over here is our open and current statuses. So just looking at these three years here, we have, um, it looks like both fiscal year 21 and 22 um, are not open and neither one of them are current. Now you can have more than one year open, but you can only have one year current, just like you can in use s and roll. Um, what's nice is it's not months, it's years here. So it makes it a little easier. <laughs> Um, but uh, so right now we have our open uh, year as 2023, because that's marked true. And we also have that marked um, as our current year. And the way that I know that too, is it shows me right up here that 2023 is current. Um, so if I wanted to go in and create um, a report um, with last year's information on it, I don't have to open that um, year. So let's let's say I want to run a fixed asset by sort from 2022. All I need to do is make that year current and then run the report. Um, so I don't have to reopen 2022. One thing to keep in mind when you're opening re or closing and that reopening periods and reclosing periods is that if you've got the report bundle um, set up, it's going to create a new report bundle. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, one other thing is, you know, we did have some issues last fall uh, with reopening um, periods and reclosing them. The life to date was um, kind of getting uh, messed up. It was adding another year's worth of life to date. Well, we fixed that now so that if you go in and reopen a period and reclose it, it's not going to add an additional year of life to date depreciation. Um, it's going to stay the same. Um, when it knows that you reopened the period and reclosed it. Um, obviously, if you went in, reopened the period, and you processed some transactions, and then you reclosed the period, um, that's going to make a difference because you've got more acquisitions, you've got more items. Um, so your reports, you probably want a new set of reports because those new reports are going to reflect the changes that you've made. Okay, so that's just touching upon core. I just wanted to note that because it's very important that this information um, is you know, set up, set up correctly, especially if you're talking a brand new district. Most of your districts have already migrated over. This information's already been put into place. So um, if they you know, need to go in and add another location, another item category, they can go into core and do that and just add those in manually. Um, if like on this fiscal year grid, they need to change um, the threshold amounts, you can't go just in here and edit them in here. Um, that is takes place underneath the capitalization criteria underneath the system. So once, once that has been set, and let's say they increase the dollar limit to 6,000, then um, that's doing a lot of behind the scene things as well as you know, there may be some items that once were capitalized that are no longer because you increase the threshold. So that's going to be doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff as well. Um, but we'll get into some of that stuff tomorrow when we talk about the gap reports. Okay. Any questions on or any other further questions? I think I've answered what was out here in chat. So like I said, Tammy, um, that first one, maybe I didn't answer that completely. So if you find all the items with that asset class in the items grid, can they recalculate life to date to get it to update? Yes. So when you're in items, um, you can filter on that asset class, select those and click the depreciate option, and it will recalculate depreciation. Now, when we talk about depreciation more 
on Friday, I do want to make note of a couple things when regarding using the depreciate option that um, you know you just want to be made aware of, and we'll go into that in more detail on Friday. Okay, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go underneath transactions. That's what we're getting into here. And I wanna go into um, the items one first. You'll see we have one, two, three, four, five different options. Um, we have the items, which is basically where we're going to go in and actually process our, and add our items, edit items. Um, so these are tags that are out there on the system. Um, when the item is created, the related acquisition gets created. I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Um, and we'll get into the filters here in a little bit. Um, so, correct. So, this is going to contain the detailed information on the fixed asset. So, when creating an item, it's going to create an item record underneath transactions items. It is going to create an associated acquisition record. And that's stored underneath the transactions menu underneath acquisitions. So, that's if the gap, if the gap flag is enabled. So if you're using the pending file to create an item, that associated acquisition record will include like the purchase order information, the PO number, item number, vendor information, um, the account that was used on the PO item, what was used to actually purchase the item. That is going to get pulled in, um, that gets stored on the pending file. And when you go to create an item using the pending file, all that information populates into the acquisition. So if the acquisition is basically the source, you know, where did this come from? Um, what PO did I, you know, this tag shows that it was a desk. What PO is, uh, was used to purchase that? That's in the acquisitions. So um, what's nice is using the pending file pulls all that information in automatically. So if districts aren't using the pending file, um, I, you know, I think that's something that you definitely need to let them know about, um, is that, you know, inventory does talk to you, SAS. And as long as those items are being tracked for inventory, which I'll talk about when we get into pending items, then that information can get pulled in to the pending file in inventory and then automatically populate all that in the acquisition program. Um, so it really saves them a lot of time or else when they go in to create the item and they're in that acquisition portion, they have to manually enter that in the, the account code, the PO, the item, the check. So it might be easier just to use the pending file to do that. It will save them time. Um, the acquisition date um, when you're creating an item must be in an open period. So if I've got 22 open and 23, um, and I'm still creating some information in 22, um, that period's open, so it'll allow me to create items in that period. Um, also, um, the gap flag is enabled. It's going to check the capitalization threshold, uh, determine if this item should be marked as a capitalized asset. Um, so, and I think I you know, said that earlier when I was answering Sharon's question. Yes, so that stuff needs to be set up ahead of time because once that item gets created, it's going to look and say, what's my threshold? Um, you know, what year is it? What year is open? I'm mean, just going to look at those things and then it's going to establish then um, that item with the proper capitalization status. So some other features in um, underneath the items option is you can split an existing item into multiple items. Um, in order to do that, the value and the number of items field on that item must be greater than one. Um, deleting, you can remove an item from the system. Um, capitalized items can only be deleted if they contain an acquisition date in an open period. So capitalized assets um, have to be in an open period in order for you to actually use the delete option. Otherwise, you have to create a disposition transaction to basically dispose of, of the item. It won't delete it. It'll just change the status of it from active to disposed of, and it will have a related disposition transaction. 
Um, but if let's say I went in and added a, added a bus, you know, and I realized I was in the wrong year and I just want to get rid of it because that year's still open, I can delete it. Um, so, um, but otherwise, if it's in another year, I can't go in and just delete that capitalized asset. I have to go in and post a disposition transaction. Um, Non-capitalized items can be deleted. Um, so it's, you know, if you're tracking items and um, just to track them um, on the system that they aren't considered a capitalized asset. Um, and a lot of people do that just so they have, you know, a, a list of where things are at in the district. Um, then those can be deleted from the system. Depreciation ops, options. Um, there is a depreciate option from the items grid where you can go in and select specific fields and use the depreciate. Um, and that will calculate depreciation from scratch. And like I said earlier, we will get into that on Friday because I wanna show you the difference between that and creating a depreciation transaction within an item. That's the second option. So if I wanna go into a specific item and edit it and post a depreciation transaction within that item, I can do that as well. Um, so we'll get into that more on Friday. Okay, so before we get into acquisitions, let me show you um, items. Grid. Okay. And so before we get started um, and actually doing, um, taking you through like the steps of how to create an item, I just wanna talk about the grid that you're seeing up here. Uh, I have a certain way that I set up my grid um, that makes sense to me. And anyone can do that by going up to more and selecting those fields. Um, and, and when you actually go in and check mark one, it should pull it in here and display it and you can remove them as well. Um, I really like this because it's instant. It doesn't reset the grid. Um, it just deletes that or adds that column. And so with that, then once I go in and start adding stuff, I can go in and start moving stuff around. And that's where I really get kind of crazy. Um, but this is where I actually go in and say, yeah, I want to see the item. I want to see its description. I want to see its status. Is it capitalized? I'm going to move that over here. I just dragged that over. And then I've got all the other miscellaneous information. So I really want location maybe over here because I just do. And so these are all the different columns that I like to see. So once that's here, it's good. You know, I go log out, come back in, it stays. Um, so that's another thing to really push um, your users is to make these grids their own, customize them um, to what makes sense to them. And so in here too, we have done a lot of work on filtering. When we first did started up uh, inventory a while ago, well over a year ago, um, not a lot of great filtering capabilities and we have changed that. And those are listed on the PowerPoint, all the different ways you can filter. Um, regarding the PowerPoint too, I probably will be making changes to that PowerPoint as we go. So um, after Friday, I will definitely probably be updating the PowerPoint. And so definitely something that you can then download and use any of that for your training sessions. Um, but it probably still is a little bit of a work in progress. Um, so in my items, going back to the filtering, um, I can filter on the tag. And what I really like about this is I can just start entering stuff in and it just starts filtering from my starting point. So here it's filtering in, I typed in BE and it just starts, boom, filtering stuff in here. So that is really neat. I really do like that uh, capability. Um, I can also type in a uh, number, numeric, and it will go out there. And you'll notice too, because tag numbers can be numeric and alphanumeric, you're going to see like, here's a good example, um, is that it's not real um, easy for it to sort um, well because of the alphanumeric and numeric sorting capabilities in here. So you're gonna see like 9602, and then it's gonna to jump to this. I can try and resort and stuff like that, um, but that helps a little bit, but you'll notice like down here too, 
It's got, I'm gonna resort this way. It's still going to, you know, go out there and and still pull in like more characters because it doesn't know that it's an actual true digit because it can accept numeric and alphanumeric characters. So that's where you're gonna kind of see something like this where you're like, whoa, that's not the next number. Actually it is because it's looking at the characters and not so much like true digits. Um, so that's, you know, filtering um, with the um, inventory tag. Um, also, I can, like in the description, I can use the wildcards. And this is all underneath um, the documentation, underneath the search options in each of the chapters. So I can start typing in, um, type in the word line and I surround it with um, the percent signs. It's gonna go out there and find anything in the description that has a word line in it. So I can remove some of those wildcards too if I wanna find beginning, end. Um, but it's definitely going to be easy for them to filter by a certain item based on their description. So I really like that. Um, if they want to, you know, after they filter, they want to pull these out into a spreadsheet, they can click on the export grid items and it will pull it out. And I'll talk about that more in here in a little bit. Um, so some other filtering here. One thing I wanted to touch upon is because I know we've gotten tickets on is the location code. Now the location code, you know, all most all these other fields are single fields, but the location code is really combined. It's the location category and the location number combined underneath one field. So it kind of can get a little tricky trying to find specific location codes. Um, but the best way to actually find a specific one, like let's say I want to find all the miss uh, 9999. I can type in MISC. And then a percent sign, 9999. And, and it is case sensitive, as you can tell. So it is case sensitive. Um, and so what it's going to do then, it's going to go out there and just filter on just those. I put a wild card in between basically the location category and the location number to pull all of those in. And it just pulls in those specific locations. So if I wanted to go in and let's say, let's say all of these location codes have, have changed, all of these items used to be in this 9999, and I want them to uh, change to, um, I don't know, something totally different. I can go in and do this and click on export grid, and it will pull those all out into a spreadsheet I can go to that spreadsheet, make the changes on the location code, and then I can import them back in and update those existing items with their no, new location codes. Um, could you have done just miss percent sign? I don't believe that, that that's going to include not just the 9999, but any other miss ones that I have. Pretty sure. And I'm not sure if I have more than just 9999, but I'm assuming it would. If I had 0001, it would include those in here. Um, let me see. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other ones. So I'm going to look do us. I'm going to do a C219. Oops. And just do the percent sign. I've got O2s. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming it, that's what it's doing. Um, I'm not sure if I have more than that. I'd have to look and see, but it looks like I'm assuming that it's going to be pulling all like the C219 is the location category, and that's going to pull anything C219 and plus all the room numbers underneath it. But for me to go in and do be specific here, I could actually then and see, I just wanna see the 0002, then it's gonna pull just that particular location. Uh, so, um, so I think, yeah, this is more of a specific, where this is more general, just finding the location category, not so much the number.
It's just my data <laughs> doesn't really show that well. Okay. And those are definitely things you guys can play around with. Um, one other thing that just was on the last release is date ranges. Um, being able to put them in there instead of doing um, greater than or less than, um, you can actually do the dot dot in here. So if I want to pick on the acquisition date here and put in 7.1.22 dot dot to 7.31.22, it should pull just those specific ones. Um, and it will just pull any acquisitions with that date range. And you'll notice too, I didn't have to actually put in like 07 slash 18 slash, you know, or zero, yeah, 2022. 20, I just put the, you know, one month, you know, the first digit of the month and two digits of the year. Um, and it still found that. So, um, yay. Yeah, I know exactly, right? Um, we've been needing that, um, but it's just for date ranges right now. So you can't do that on tag numbers um, and stuff like that. You can only do that on fields that have a date in them. So yes, that just went out on the, I think, 134 release. Okay, I think that's it for those. Um, obviously, you can filter on like amounts as well by doing less than great, greater than on the original cost, and it will just find, if I want to find if I have any items over a million dollars, I can do the greater than sign million, uh, enter that in without the commas, um, and it will go out there and find anything um, that's greater than a million dollars. So lots of um, better filtering than what we had before. Uh, and I know that, yeah, that's one thing. I think we still have maybe another issue regarding the tag number one um, and needing a range in there. But um, the filtering is kind of nice how you can just go in and start entering stuff and it filters down. Um, I just don't know with it being a, a number or um, alphanumeric if it is going to be able to handle that in here. So, okay. So let's go in and talk about what you're seeing on the items grid. So I'm just going to um, pick on, you know, one of these here right away. If I go in and look at a particular item, um, I know right away just looking here because I have the capitalized column on my grid that I know that this is a non-capitalized asset. It's telling me right here it's false. Um, also, when I look at the original cost, it's um, $3,600. Um, my cap criteria is 5,000. So obviously it's going to be a non-cap item because it didn't meet my cap threshold. Um, so um, by clicking on this, I can go in and view it. Here I can go in and directly edit it. And here I have the ability to delete this because it is a non-cap item. You'll notice on these ones where the status is um, disposed of, um, but it was a capitalized asset, it doesn't let me delete those. I can't because it's a capitalized asset. Now, ones that are disposed of and um, are non cap I do have the trash can there active that I can go in and delete those. Um, so we mimic the same thing that um, uh, the way that classic behaved um, and that behavior. So. Um, it should be the same way that um, your districts were used to doing that in classic. Um, just to talk about what you see up here, we're going to be going in and creating an item here in a little bit. Like I said, you can go in and export items. So please filter first. Filter on what you know specifically you need uh, because there's probably a reason why you're wanting to export this, right? You've got something you need to filter on. So you use the filter bar um, to go in and enter those filters, and then you click on the export grid. Now, when doing that, um, and I'm just going to click on it just to show you the options, you have a CSV option and you have an Excel option. Now, if you're wanting to go in and make some changes per se to existing items, I would definitely be going in and making sure that you use the Excel option because 
Excel goes in and retains, when you open up that um, Excel file in Excel, it's going to retain the leading zeros. And that's a big deal in here because your tag numbers may have leading zeros because it's looking at them because it can accept numeric or alphanumeric characters. Um, your fun codes have leading zeros. Maybe some of your locations have leading zeros. Um, your asset classes may have leading zeros. So using the Excel option is definitely recommended. And that is listed in the documentation, um, especially during the import sections. Um, and I believe also underneath our search options in the chapters, um, it says, you know, it's recommended to use Excel. Um, it's really so much with, you know, the items one here um, to use that if you're actually going in to make changes and then wanting to re-import your changes and using our system import option. Um, so, okay, let's get started here. Um, Excel option also handles commas in the descriptions better too. Yeah, if they have just, if they have commas and descriptions, maybe, I don't know, some of them might have them in maybe serial numbers or something, I doubt it, but, um, but if they do, um, it will handle that better because the CSV looks at that, you know, it's a comma separated symbol, right? A comma where Excel doesn't like take that into consideration. So um, I believe that we do have a JIRA issue for that, that we may be able to fix that in here that the CSV won't recognize that um, as a comma per se. Um, and I think there's a, a JIRA issue for that one. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on create. And in here, it's taking me to what I call like the acquisition portion of your item creation. So if you're thinking back to classic, when you clicked on item screen um, or used, I'm sorry, F12 for item screen, um, it brought up this acquisition transaction window first. Well, that's what you're seeing here. And so um, I can use my pending file so if the pending file set up and you've got goodies in there, um, you can go in here and select those specific ones. If not, and you wanna enter an item manually and, and manually enter the acquisition information, you can do that as well by just bypassing this. I'm gonna take the easy way out and I'm just gonna pull one of these in. And so this is why I just you know feel like it's so important that districts know that they can get this set up so that does the work for them. Um, so they got their pending file populated. They can pick the item. And I know that I just, I don't have that many. Um, so I was able to use the drop down. You can also type things in here, the PO number, and it will filter. And then you can just select the one that you want. And then obviously it'll populate. Um, so my tag number, I'm sure that I've got tag number here for you guys. I think that's the next available number I have. Um, and then let's just talk about what you're seeing here. So I entered in my next available tag number. Um, my type is acquisition, or I do have payment as well. Payment, I think, might be more related to like lease um, type of assets. Um, but this is an, an item that I purchased, that I acquired. So it's considered an acquisition. And that's going to be the default type. Um, the date of my acquisition. So remember in um, configuration when I was talking about using receive dates and invoice dates. So if I have it set up, check mark to use receive dates, it's going to pull the received date on the um, invoice and pull it in here as the acquisition date. Otherwise, if that isn't checked, it's going to pull the invoice date as the acquisition date in here. So um, so here's my acquisition date, uh, the um, account code that was um, used on the purchase order. So this was the account code was used to purchase the item, um, the vendor number and the vendor name, and the purchase order date. So this was the invoice date. This is the purchase order date. Um, the amount of that item was $1,500. So I know right away that this is not going to be a capitalized asset because it doesn't meet the $5,000 threshold. 
Um, here's my PO number, the item related to the PO check. If I had any grant information here, that could be put in. Um, and you'll notice here that these are blank and pretty much grayed out. These are will not get filled in until we get to the next screen. This is the fund function and asset class that you're going to assign to this item. So that doesn't get done here. That'll get done on the next screen. And then those um, ones, the fund function asset code that you enter on the next screen will populate in here as well. And so really, because I pulled mostly everything in from my pending file, all I really did was just add the tag number. I'm going to go ahead and click on continue item. <clears throat> And now it's taking me to the next screen. And this is the rest of my item information. So I'm out of the acquisition screen um, and it's taking me to complete the rest of it here. And so again, some of that stuff in the pending file is going to get populated in here. The first thing I notice is that capitalize is not checked. It shouldn't be because it didn't meet the threshold. So there's my tag number. And these are things that I can fill in manually. Uh, secondary tag, serial model number, uh, appraisal tag, here's the description that came in from the PO. Um, my category code, I can go in and enter a specific category code. I can go in and select one. I'll just select playground. Um, the number of items that came in from the pending file. And here's where I'm gonna enter in my fund function and asset class. And so I'm just gonna select these here. Let's see, this is maintenance equipment and it's fixtures furniture. If I have an organization code, I can put that in here. Um, and this is for the middle school. <clears throat> That's where this is going to be basically in that area. Where it's actually located in the middle school, I would have to go in and actually you know, enter that in. I can start typing in, I think like office. And it should go out there and find anything with the word office. I can put in the actual um, location code in here as well. And it should filter by that. So I've selected that one. By default, it's always going to select active. Um, the replacement cost and insurable values are coming from the acquisition amount that I put in on the prior screen. So $1,500, those can be changed, um, but it's just going to populate with the acquisition amount. So that's my current information. And then I've got my acquisition information. Again, a lot of this is already pre-populated based on what I entered on the prior screen because that was my acquisition screen. My acquisition date starting here, the purchased method, um, that's the default. I can change this if I want to. If this is really a donated item, I can click on donated, leased or other. Those are the different ones. Um, a lot of these other things are grayed out. Beginning balance, this item, <clears throat> is for one thing, it's not capitalized um, and it was just entered this year. So there's no beginning balance yet. If this was a capitalized asset and I went in and um, entered this item this year, it's still gonna show beginning balance of zero. But once I close this year, that gets populated with the original cost. Whatever the original cost is, will go into the beginning balance because that's needed for the gap reports. Um, so that's especially the gap schedules. The schedule change in fixed assets um, is going to be looking at that for that beginning balance column. Uh, let's see, there's a discounted amount. You can put that in here, um, but the original cost I can't modify in here. Um, you notice that people were able to do that. Um, we locked that down. Um, that is coming from the prior screen where we entered the acquisition amount. Once it's entered in there, um, you can't go into the original cost to make a change. The depreciation information is the next section. And so um, by default, it is going to, to make it straight line, um, but that can be changed to none or declining balance. We will really get into all of this on Friday. We don't have time today to get into this, um, but um, it, we're going to let it default to straight line. Um, the beginning date is always going to be the same date as the acquisition date. You can change this. Most people leave it go because you're, you acquired it on the 23rd. So that is really when depreciation starts. Um, we did, uh, we are fixing an issue that we have right now with um, backdating uh, beginning dates. Um, it was allowing people to do that. So we have an issue we're working on to prevent that. 
so you can't backdate them. Um, life expectancy, I can put in a life expectancy. Let's say this is five years. Um, if I have a salvage value, I can put this in here. Salvage values aren't required, um, but they can be put in. Depreciation transactions, we'll get into Friday. We won't even talk about those. Um, and then also, if this was an actual lease, if your acquisition method was leased up here, then you could go down here and select the lease type, capitalized or operating. So capitalized are assets that, if you mark capitalized, I'm assuming this is a capitalized asset, and it's going to show up then um, underneath your gap reports, underneath the leased information. Um, if it's operating, those will not appear on the gap reports. And then just some miscellaneous information about your lease. You can set up the, pay the payment period, um, when the lease started and stuff like that. Um, and then these bottom ones are just user-defined fields. So all they are just like we had in Classic. And so if everything looks good here, it'll tell me if it doesn't like something, I'll click on save item. And it's gonna go out there then and it's gonna save this item and it just kind of refreshes the screen and the menu options up here have changed. Um, so if I wanna go back in, I noticed I selected the lo wrong location. I can go into edit and edit that location. If I just wanna exit out of here altogether, I can click on close and it'll take me out of this window. Um, if I have an additional acquisition, I wanna to add to this. So let's say I purchased a bus and I really have three purchase order items um, that all are related to the bus purchase. I want them all underneath this one tag. So in order to do that, I can click on the add acquisition and that brings up the acquisition window and allows me to pull the second item from the pending file and add that item to, or add that acquisition to this existing item. So now I have two acquisitions for that one item. When I add that second acquisition, there's an option, do you wanna update the original cost by whatever that second acquisition amount is? When I check that then, it's gonna increase the original cost by that second item. So once I have that one added, if I need to add that third one, I can do another add acquisition and I can add a third acquisition onto this existing item. And once I do that, then I will have three acquisitions. Um, and if the total amount of those three acquisitions is 80,000, and I made sure that I updated the original cost um, to include you know, all three items, then my original cost down here should be 80,000 as well. I will be able to see those acquisitions in the actual acquisition option in transactions. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll close out of here. Um, sorry, before I do that, the split is not enabled. And the reason why it isn't, number of items is one. If it was greater than one, that would be enabled to allow me to split this into individual tags. I'm gonna go ahead and click on close. And um, now that tag has been added. And um, if I wanted to look, um, and see what the actual um, amount was for that or the acquisition was for that tag. Like I said, I can go into transactions and acquisitions. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter that item, that tag that I just entered in. And this was the one. And you'll notice right away, the capitalization says false because it was underneath that threshold. And, you know, because I've you know, customized my grid here to what I want it to be, all this information you know, is probably the stuff that I look at most often. Um, but if I wanted to go back in and view this again, I can. Um, I can also delete it if I made a mistake. Um, but if I wanted to go in and look at the actual acquisition that's tied to this, I can go underneath acquisitions and enter that same tag number in. And here's the acquisition information. And if I just view that quickly, um, you'll see here that um, this is the stuff that I entered in on that first screen when we first created the item. So it's all populated in here. It automatically marks the update original cost. It check marks that automatically um, while I was creating that item. 
And also um, it populated my fund function and asset class that I selected. So those are in here as well. Um, so that's basically kind of a go through or run through of creating just a single item um, underneath the items option here. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna go ahead and split an item. So I'm gonna pick on one here. And so what I'm looking at when I select this item is I'm looking at the number of items right away. Whoops, oops, oops. Um, and so it's eight. So that's telling me, great, I can split it. It's an active status. So it all looks good. Um, you'll notice that the capitalization said it's true too. So once I split these out, um, because you know it's over the threshold, um, once I split these out though into eight separate tags, those eight tags will no longer be capitalized, right? Because the 5520 is going to be divided by eight separate tags. So those new tags will all show with a capitalization of false. They will not be capitalized. Um, because I'm splitting them out like that too, um, that will change things. Like because it was a capitalized asset, it was included in my gap schedules, it no longer will be included because I made them separate non cap items. Um, so in order to split this here, I'm going to go ahead and just view this. And you'll notice that the split tag is enabled. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in, um, I can change this and say maybe, you know, I am using 24079, 24080, 81. So it's not going to allow me to start from this because those tags are already being used. I could go in and put an entirely different set of tag numbers here. Um, so if I go ahead and totally change this, 24078 will no longer exist on the system once I split them. Um, I think I'm in the clear. I don't think there are others. So I'm gonna just go ahead and enter my number of tags, which my, my uh, number of items was eight. So that's gonna be my number of tags. And what I love about this is that it gives me a projection. So, and that will then warn me if I've already, you know, using those um, successive numbers. Um, so it looked like my I was good because it didn't give me any warnings when I did that validate. And when I so I'm still on the projection. So when I click on split item, I'm going to go out there and it's going to create a report. And this is just a projection report. And this is basically then detailing what it is going to do. So it's going to take that 24078 and it's still going to use it, but it's going to become, um, it's going to change the amount obviously to 690. So it's dividing that 5520. And so if I went in and actually then went in and did an actual split, all of these items then will show as non-cap with this information and it's going to pull the same information from that original item into here. So um, I know we do have um, some issues out there to um, make this a bit more user friendly, like allowing them to go in and add serial and model numbers before they do the split and stuff like that. So I know we have some Jira issues out there to make some improvements to splits. Um, but this is basically how it's working right now. And so I'm just going to close out of here. Um, and I think we also have an uh, a fix that we need to do that will keep this window open so that you can just uncheck the, um, I think it, well, I think that did work. I'm sorry. Let me do the split again. Here. I think um, all I needed to do was just uncheck this. And when I do that, then um, validate it again, it will go out there and actually split them, you know, fill in my eight here. Um, and it will create eight separate tags. So it really is an easy process. There's really not a whole lot to it. Um, but that's basically how you go in. So for fun, let's just do that here. Um, I'm going to validate again. And because this is unchecked, it's going to actually go out there and split them. 
Michelle, just a yes. quick question. If you did, if you forgot to put that number in, like putting uh, it into a certain amount of um, items, would it give you a warning or will it just like do it? Like, I mean, if you don't put a number in, it's not going to really do anything. I'm just curious about that. Yeah, it shouldn't. If I didn't put a number in there, it should have given me a warning or saying I can't do anything because I don't know how many you want to split this into. So um, okay. it should, yeah, and there might be a warning, but um, it shouldn't allow the split um, because you didn't put a specific number to split it into. Okay, just making sure. Thanks. And so this is basically what it's looking like now. So if I go back out there and look at 24078, I don't even have to close out. Um, so this is 24078 and you'll notice now it no longer says it's capitalized because it no longer meets the threshold and that the um, original cost is now 690. And when I did that too, you'll notice that it also updated the replacement and insurable values two to 690. So basically went out there and kind of took care of the whole thing. Um, and then if I needed to make any changes in here on each of those, I can. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close here and just type in 2407. And then just kind of, um, these are the actual ones that were split then. So pretty easy. All right, so that's splits. And that's basically like items in a nutshell. Like I said, I will talk about depreciate on Friday. Let me go through the depreciation um, training. Um, but that's kind of like where we're at with just creating an item, um, modifying an item. I can go in and go into any of these items and edit them. Um, when I do go in and edit, you know, obviously, like I said, there's certain fields that it will allow you to edit um, and certain fields that it won't. So um, you'll notice here that even though this isn't a capitalized asset, because I have my gap flag enabled, I can't just go in and change the fund function and asset class. I would have to create a transfer transaction and do that. Um, same thing with original cost, I can't go in and change that. Um, if I needed to increase the original cost of this asset, I would have to create an acquisition transaction to update the original cost and then that will, um, or decrease, maybe it's too much and I need to decrease it, I put in a negative acquisition um, to decrease the original cost, that will update it. Um, so those are the, the big ones that um, you can't just go in and change. If I have the wrong category, um, then I can definitely go in and make that change there. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our acquisitions. I was just in items. Now I'm gonna to move to acquisitions. <clears throat> and like I said, Acquisitions contain the related information from the fixed asset. So when we created that item, um, it created the acquisition that's tied to it. And I went into the acquisition and we took a look at that. Um, so it's always with the gap flags enabled, it's always going to create those um, acquisitions. Um, and like I said, if the item is created using the, the pending file, um, that all that associated acquisition purchase order information will pre-populate. And we saw that too, when we went and created the item and it took us to the acquisition window right away, I selected that item from the pending that purchase order, boom, it loaded all the information in. Um, if, if the item is created without using the pending file um, or it's via spreadsheet, um, especially via spreadsheet, if I have an item spreadsheet with all these um, laptops that I need to um, import in, um, there is an option to create the acquisition. And when it mass imports those laptops, the related acquisition information can only contain the tag number, the acquisition date, and the acquisition amount. It doesn't have the ability to automatically, there's no place to put the purchase order number or the check and stuff like that. Um, so what can happen then is after those get updated, you can extract those acquisitions out 
load the PO and the check information in and import it back in and update those existing acquisitions with that you know, purchase order um, information. Um, additional acquisitions can be created for existing items. Like I said, when I showed you earlier, if I needed to go in and change the original cost of an item, I can't go in and modify that original cost field. I have to go in and add an additional acquisition. And there is an option to update the original cost. So that'll go out there and update it. So now I will have two acquisitions against that one item. Um, also, you will see an error adjustment um, checkbox. And so a lot of people are like, what's that for? Um, and basically that is showing that you meant to add that acquisition or that disposition or that transfer transaction. It's in all three um, in a prior year. So, um, so if I went in and disposed of an asset and I should have disposed of it last year, what I can do is um, when I create that disposition transaction, I can check mark the air flag. And what happens, especially if this is a capitalized asset, that's where it's really of importance. Um, it'll show on like the gap schedules, the gap change schedules, it'll show in the adjustments column and not as a true disposition in the current year. So it should have, should have happened last year and I forgot to do it. So I don't want it to show as a true disposition this year. I wanna check that error adjustment flag so, the, so that that disposed of amount will show up in my adjustment column on my gap schedules. Okay, so let's go in and look at disposition or look at acquisitions here. Let me see if there's anything I wanted to show you. I think basically what I want to show you, I've got a 990 here, is, you know, I've got an acquisition out here. This has to have an item type to it. I should be able to go in transactions into items and look up the same number and see an item related to this acquisition. Um, but just to go in and just view this, um, I'm going to actually go in and edit it. And you can tell that this was created in this fiscal here and that the amount is 60,000. Um, so it's definitely a capitalized asset. But like I said, um, this just shows you all of the purchase order related information tied to this acquisition. Um, so if I wanted to actually go in and create an additional acquisition to this, right now, I mean, I only have one acquisition against this and it's for 60,000. Um, but I wanted to, let's say I had, I bought a radio or something for the, for the uh, bus and I want to add it to this existing tag, what I can do is um, I can create an additional acquisition and I don't have a, a pending for this one per se, pending item. And I'm going to put in today's date, that fine, that's fine. If I want to put in a specific account here, I can. Now, one question that we have um, is, um, does it validate any of this stuff? No, it's not going to go and see that the one 2810 is an actual valid account use S. Not yet. We do have a JIRA issue for that. But when it comes to the account code, the vendor and the vendor name, you can put whatever you want in there. And it's not going to go back and use S and validate those. Um, but we do have JIRA issues to um, find a way to, to sync those so that it does uh, allow you to select an account code or a vendor um, from USAS. And let's just put in. And let's say it's in, uh, back in January. And let's say the amount for this radio was $500. And you'll notice right away that it defaults to update original cost. Um, it's going to, um, because it thinks that you're trying to update the original cost with this additional acquisition. You can uncheck that if you want to. Um, if I've got purchase order information, I can put that in here too. 
I'm just going to go ahead and create this acquisition. And because that was already set as well, now I should have two acquisitions against this tag, the 60,000 and the 500. And now if I go in and look up this tag underneath items, my original cost should have updated by the $500 as well because I told it to, I checked it. Um, so now my original cost is 60,500. So I've got one item now with two acquisitions. And that's basically acquisitions in a nutshell here. Any questions about the acquisition portion? Okay, I'm gonna move right on. Dispositions is the next transaction. And so you would use, uh, you would create a disposition when you want to um, dispose of an asset. The district is no longer using it. Um, and so this gives you a way of marking um, why, um, you know, was it sold? Was it destroyed? Was it stolen? You know, stuff like that. It allows you to create, to add a depreciate or a disposition method um, to it. And what happens then is that item does not get removed from the system. It just updates the item with the disposed of status and then creates the associated disposition underneath the disposition transaction grid. Um, and again, it's got the air adjustment. That was the example that I explained earlier. It's supposed to be disposed of last year. So I'm gonna air adjust it so it shows an adjustment. And really that's most important when it comes to your capitalized assets. So it appears correctly on your gap reports. Okay, so let's go and take a look at that here. I'm gonna go underneath dispositions and I'm gonna look and see what I have, quite a few here. So these are all the ones that migrated over um, from classic. And so if I wanna go in and actually um, create a dispos disposition, I click on create. And what's nice is that it gives me an option to enter in, to pick an item, or I can start entering in one. I think I have one here. And so that's the one that I want. And I should be able to do it by description too. Um, and what it does is it loads all the information in here, which is nice. Um, so it's going to default to today's date, and that's fine. I'm in that correct period. Um, the amount received, and this is informational. Um, so if I did sell this and I got $5,000 for it, I can put that in here. Here's where it's looking at my core codes and allowing me then to, um, let's say it was auction or something like that. Um, it allows me to uh, select an existing disposition code. And here I can put an authorized by, uh, maybe it's the treasurer's um, name or the superintendent or whoever's in charge of that area. And then you'll notice that these get pre-populated. It's pulling the fund function asset class and the original cost into here, um, as well as the number of items, there's eight of them. And then from here then, like I said, if this was something that should have been um, disposed of last year, I could check the air adjustment flag. And it will still you know, show here on the grid as normal, but on the gap reports, it'll be displayed in that adjustments column. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on create. And that um, item is now created. It's in here. If I go ahead and do a search, I'm gonna close out of here. It will bring it up. Um, and again, I can go in and change things around in here and add and remove um, columns on my grid. So if I go in then and look up this particular item, it should have a status of disposed of, and it does. So it was active. Now that I created the related disposition transaction, it automatically updates that to disposed of. Okay, any questions about dispositions? Pretty simple. I am gonna run over a little bit here. I was trying to get this done in an hour and a half, but it might may be more closer to two hours before we go done here. 
Um, transfers is the one I think I'm going to hit on next. And so what a transfer is, is, you know, this is really um, important when your gap flag is enabled. Um, if you have a fund function or asset class that is incorrect on an existing item, you need to change that. When we were in the item grid, that, those were three fields that were grayed out. We can't just go in and update them when um, the gap flag's enabled. So instead, you need to post a transfer transaction um, to change um, the fund, the function, or the asset class. So those are the only three options you have in transfers. And so this is our transfer grid. So these are the existing transfers that are out here. And this is such an improvement from our classic program where you've got to see like two transfers at a time. I just, I love the grids. Same thing with dispositions and stuff too. Um, and so you see all these, you can filter in here. You can add, I think there may be a couple more columns. The error adjustment flag's the only other one on here. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create a transfer. <laughs> And I'm gonna pick one that I already have selected here. And again, I can start typing in or I can hit the drop down. And this was the tag number I want. Again, it pulls in the original cost of that item right away. Um, default date of today is fine. And then it's asking me what type of transfer do you wanna do? Are you trying to change the fund number? the function or the asset class. And I think this one, I'm gonna change the function. And when I select function, it pulls up the function tied to that item, 1310. Well, what I wanna do is I wanna add a new one. And what's nice is that because it knows I selected function, it gives me the available function codes um, to pick from. And so I can say, I want office equipment. And again, if this was something that should have been done in a prior year, um, I could click on the air adjustment flag, and then those transfer amounts are going to, instead of showing in the transfer in and out columns on the gap change schedules, they are going to show on the adjustment column on those change schedules. And so I go ahead and click on create. And now um, it's showing the trans, you know, I, I can close out of here, but definitely. This tag now should be showing 2121 on my item and its related acquisitions. I have to remember there's acquisitions tied to this item too. So let's go find out and see if it did that. So my function is now showing 2121 on the item. And then if I go into acquisitions, I do have two acquisitions against this, and they are both reflecting the 2121 function. So it updated the item and its related acquisitions. Any questions about transfers? Pretty, pretty basic. And when we get into um, the gap reports tomorrow, we'll be looking at the change schedules um, and looking at the actual uh, columns on there and going into that a little bit more uh, regarding, you know, the disposition columns, the transfer columns and things like that. Okay. Okay, now, not to talk about this first, but not much to transfers. Um, what's going to take a little more time is the pending items. And I do want to go through these two um, slides because I think hopefully they'll be They'll be helpful for you um, when you do your training. Um, so the pending items is basically a holding file of all your PO data that was entered, um, that will be entered as an item in inventory. So this comes from USAS. Um, so it originates when you're doing the AP invoicing in USAS, or if you're using um, a third-party software and it's set up there as well. Uh, but I'm just gonna focus on USAS for now. Um, so the pull from USAS um, is going to search for invoice PO items. There's a pull from USAS option in pending items, and it's going to look for those invoiced PO items inclusive 
of the starting invoice date. So if I put in October 1st of 2022, it's going to go out there and look for any invoice purchase orders with the date starting October 1st of 2022. And it's going to look for those that are only marked for inventory. So if you think back in AP invoice and you've got your pending threshold amount in there, um, there is an option at the end when you're invoicing that allows you to mark that for, for inventory. Um, and so once you post that invoice, then that gets what, what we call marked for inventory. So the pending, the pull from USAS is going to look for those. And it's going to look for those marked um, invoices. Um, and it has to meet the pending threshold criteria that's set up in USASR or your third party. Um, so with USAS, there is some initial setup for that. Um, we've got the EIS Classic in Integration Module and the EIS Classic Integration Configuration that need to be set up beforehand. These were all part of the USAS post-migration steps. So those, so for your districts, those should have been part of the post-migration for that stuff to get set up right away so that when they start processing in USAS, it'll go out there and mark those items for inventory. Um, so before inventory application came about, there was an inventory extract report that would pull the information out of USAS and allow them to import it into classic EIS. Well, now that that's all gone away, um, <clears throat> this pull from USAS option underneath the pending items is going to do that um, same thing. So um, underneath transaction items, um, that's where you're gonna go and pull the pending data into a new item. And then you can also go into the acquisition option and pull pending data um, into an, an acquisition as well. Um, so those are the two ways to get that pending information in to create a tag in inventory. Um, with the pending item grid, you can delete items um, from the pending item, meaning PO items from the pending item, um, but you can't go in and edit items on the pending item grid or add items. Um, the only way you can do that is from the pull uh, from USAS. So this is a part I really want to talk about is how USAS and inventory talk to each other. Um, so like I said, in USAS, when an invoice item meets that threshold and all that configuration information has been set up in USAS, it marks that item for inventory. So in inventory, when you're pulling from USAS, those items inclusive of that starting date are pulled into the pending items grid. And so the communication process begins. So looking at this table here, PO item is invoiced, meeting pending threshold. The USSR inventory status is now pending. So, and that's basically marking it. So when in inventory, you use the pull from USAS, when pulled into pending items, it's going to go back to USAS and change that USSR inventory status to sent. It's saying, hey, I got you. I moved you over to inventory. So I just need to tell USAS now that that item has been sent to inventory. So it changes that status in USAS to sent. So when that pending item um, becomes an actual tag in inventory, it goes back again to USAS and updates it again from sent to posted to let USAS know. It's been posted as a tag in inventory now. And so if I go in an inventory and delete an item on the pending item grid, it's again is going to talk to you, SAS, and say, hey, that set that I did when I pulled it, well, I just deleted that item on the pending grid. So I want to change your status from set to rejected. Show that, you know, I'm not going to do um create an item from this pending. I'm not going to create a tag from this pending item. So I'm going to reject it. 
So the reason why all this communication is happening is because we don't want inventory going in and repulling items that have already been sent or have been posted as actual items in inventory. So that's why, you know, we have the status here so that the next time you go in and pull from USAS, it doesn't repull those sent and posted statuses. It knows. Um, also, we have an option in pending item where if you don't want it to repull a rejected status, it does that by default. But if you do, let's say you rejected something, you deleted it, it sent a status of rejected back to USAS. And then you realize, oh, I didn't need to delete that off the pending items file. Then what you can do is you say, include the rejected items when you do the poll. And it's going to go out there and find those um, invoice items with that rejected status and repull them in. So let me show you what that looks like. Michelle, can I ask a quick question? Hello? Hi, can I ask a quick question? Oh, okay. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So in in USAS, the, in order for something to be um, seen as a, as a pending item, the criteria, what are the criteria that it has to be? It has to be marked when the, when the invoice is created. Is that the only way? Okay. So I know that you guys are working um, on this already, um, but if, if, districts missed these items or they didn't know like through SE view that they had to be marked as a third party where kind of are we at with that being able to be easily fixed well do you know sorry I, I just want to know because I know it's a hot topic <laughs> for my okay. for some of my districts gotcha yeah that uh, JIRA issue is still um I don't think, I don't know if that's been scheduled yet or not. I can't say for sure, but I know we have a JIRA issue out there to fix it in USAS so that you can mark those. We do have ways right now for you to find those that are marked for inventory so that you have a list um, and you can take that information um, from USAS and you can create a spreadsheet of that information as like an inventory item spreadsheet and set it up so that you can import the items in off of that spreadsheet if you wanted to but to actually oh. like add it to like the pending file per se there's no way to do that right now but there is a way to find those in USS right now so you can confirm where where are my marked ones um, okay or are they marked um, and we do have that in that pending files chapter we have ways that you gotcha. can do a query, or we have a report de definition in there actually, that you can import that report definition into USAS and then generate those to see if there are any items that are marked for inventory. And if so, you know, and if not, you can basically do a, a filter in the AP invoices grid and get okay. that information into. Okay, okay. and that, that'll recognize the ones that came in from a CVU. As well, um, you don't because I think believe. that that was their problem is that they were they were finding the information just by doing some filtering um, of their own. The district in question, but they the SCVU transactions weren't popping up in whatever they were trying to do. I don't think it will, but I will look into that, Michelle. Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That's a good question. But yeah, I'll look into that and see. Um, but I don't think it is recognizing those um, with the third party applications. If they aren't marked in. I think, yeah, I think they went back and did it now. <laughs> like you had it. So for future, it's fixed. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's going to be able to because it, if it wasn't marked in the third party application, then and it, you know, comes over, yeah. it, it's not going to show either. So, but I'll double check yeah. that, but I'm pretty sure. Okay. All right. Thanks. Michelle, I can help with this one. I'll pipe in. Um, so cool. yeah, so you're right. The, the one you're talking about in like that, um, pending item or the pending transactions documentation, it does build off of ones that are flagged for inventory. And that one has like additional status to see what went over. 
But um, if they weren't flagged at all for inventory, they won't show on those reports. But I'm pretty sure we have like a catch up report where it'll go based on the object that you can pull those. I don't remember off the top of my head if it's in the documentation anywhere, but yeah, Michelle, I see you shaking your head. You, I, you, I knew you'd remember this because <laughs> um, because we provided that on tickets. So if that's something you need, I know we can definitely like provide it to you, provide the report definition on tickets. Um, and, and I don't remember if it's in the documentation, but I think that one is what we're looking for. Oh, you gotcha. Thank you. If you find that, Amanda, could you post that in the chat, like where that would be? Okay, yes. Thank you. Okay, so this is the actual pending items grid. Um, and so this is the information again that is getting pulled from UCS as long as that's been um, set up, you know, that it, those items have been marked on the UCS side. And so um, this is the pull from UCS option. So basically, what it's going to do is I can do a test connection before we get started just to make sure that UCS and inventory are talking and it should say test successful. Um, and then basically I'm gonna be putting in that invoice date here. So I can you know, put in you know, or January 1st or something like that. And again, if I did delete some by accident on the pending file by using this delete option over here, and I wanna repull those in because I didn't mean to, I can click on include rejected and it should pull those back in. Um, and then it will go in then and it will just populate this. It just, I don't think it creates a report. It just populates everything. Um, if you get some kind of weird error, like it can't recognize something, we do have that in the documentation as well. And that's basically, it. I think we need to improve that error, but it's basically telling you it couldn't find anything within the date range that you selected. And so again, that's where we have in the documentation. If you know that you should have some, um, we've got it in the pending files and how you can look for those marked items in USSR. And just to double check, you know, why aren't these being included? Um, and it will, you know, follow those steps um, and it will show you those items if there are any. But that's basically all you do is go in, enter in your starting date, include rejected if you want to, click on confirm, and it populates this. Um, and like I said, you can go in. Um, and delete any of these if you need to. Um, there is a mass delete by just clicking up here and clicking on delete, or you can be selective and click on delete and delete these. You can't add or edit in here. Um, do you have to mark invoices for inventory for them to flow over to pending? I thought if you had to, if you had it configured that they would flow over overmatic over automatically. They should, Tammy, um, in, uh, if you've got your pending threshold set up in USASR and you have it, the configuration screen to show, let me see, I might have, I do have an app here. Try quick show you where that's at. And so in system configuration and the EIS classic configuration, here is that threshold that you're talking about here. So if you've got a pending threshold and you also have um, automatic, if I scroll over that, it says we'll automatically update the pending file for 600. If it's checked, if unchecked, it's going to have the 500 and 600. Um, so at 600, we mean 600 to 699, um, anything within that. So if my inventory item is, you know, $6,000 and I, in, I invoiced it, I'm sorry, I, my invoice item is $6,000. I invoiced it for 6,000 and the object code on the account code related to that is a 600 level object code. It should automatically mark it when you post that invoice, yes. Um, you don't have to go in and actually mark it. Um, but if there are ones that, you know, maybe not fall within the threshold that you do want to mark for inventory, you can go in and set that EIS flag checkbox, I think, and then it will um, mark it for inventory as well. So those are kind of the two ways to do that. All right.
see if there's anything else I'm going to show you on that. I think that's it. All right, what we're going to talk about next and finish, wrap things up here is um, oh, why, when would you use the EIS checkbox on an invoice? Um, correct, you would use it if you um, don't have one that meets the threshold that you purposely want to mark for, in, for uh, invoice or for inventory um, for the pending file. Um, if you don't have configuration done, correct, that'd be another way. Um, if you don't have that configuration set up, um, you'd have to do those manually. Um, but you know, if you notice that the configuration wasn't set up, get it set up underneath USASR. So then it starts doing that automatically for you. All right, spreadsheet imports. Um, can I mass import new items? Yes. Can I dispose of items? Yes. Can I mass update fields on existing items? Yes, mostly. Um, so we'll talk about that here because obviously there are certain things that um, you may not be able to um, mass update. So um, all of the information in regards to the file specs, how to set up the spreadsheet, all of that is listed in our import documentation underneath system. So the system import option is for the users. It's for the end users to go in and add a bunch of lap laptops, dispose of a bunch of items, update location codes. Um, so it provides, you have uh, spreadsheet templates out there and it provides the detailed format information, the actual formatting of each column that is on the actual template spreadsheets that we have um, that will help to assist you guys with, or your districts with importing other uh, information. So system import is what is being used for end users. Now, um, for those of you that um, have districts that are starting new in inventory and they didn't migrate over and they want to mass load a bunch of items, but a lot of those items are from prior years, um, then there is a import migration import option underneath system configuration migration import is the name of the option and so that will allow those new districts starting up an in inventory to mass load prior year um, items so the system import and you know just that for the users um, is allowing you to import stuff for an open period and it's just for that period. Um, so for those districts, like I said, that are starting new, then they wanna go in and, uh, and you will have to assist them because only you have the ability to go into the system configuration migration import and import those for them. Okay, so before we get into the imports, the actual demo, Let's just talk about some tips when it comes to spreadsheet importing. And this is via the system import option. Um, you need to upload CSV format only. It will not accept Excel. I recommend making changes using Excel, saving changes using Excel. But when you're actually ready to go in and load this into inventory, you wanna take that Excel spreadsheet and save it in CSV format so that it's in the proper format for it to get loaded into inventory. Um, I'll show you the template spreadsheets here in a little bit that we have in the documentation. Um, so like I said before, importing transaction spreadsheets is available for transactions with dates, not just acquisition, that should be disposition uh, dates as well, within an open period. So that period has to be open. So um, that's the only way you're able to do that using the system import. I can't go in and create a spreadsheet with archived, with dates in an archived period, not using the system import. Um, in order to do that, and it's designed for districts that are starting new on inventory, it didn't migrate over, then you can import those items from those archived periods using, like I said before, the system configuration migration import, but that does require ITC intervention. They don't have access to that, so you guys will have to help them out with that. 
Um, we are in the process. We have come across a couple issues um, with the migration. Um, we've had we have one particular district that um, they're in, they're importing a lot. They're starting new um, in inventory, and they're pulling over um, items acquisition information, disposition information, and they want it all imported in. So we have steps out there in the system configuration migration documentation, but we're still twe tweaking things because we, we ran across another issue um, with that. So once that's supposed to be out, probably on the next release, if not the one after that, once that gets done and updated and we test it, then I'll probably be updating or I will be updating the system configuration migration import chapter to give you more of a thorough outline on how to go in and load all of that from archived periods for district starting new. So um, we still are working out a few bugs with that. Um, mass changing the status of an item from active to disposed of. Um, you can't go into like extract data from the items grid, change the status to disposed of and import it in, that's not gonna work. Um, you have to create a disposition spreadsheet uh, with those items you want to mass dispose of. It'll go in and you can dispose of those items. It'll, by importing those in, it creates the disposition transactions and the system's then smart, smart enough to go out to those existing items and change the status to disposed of. So those are just some tips regarding spreadsheet imports. Um, the next slide here, um, just some other recommendations. Um, when you're updating existing items. So let's say you wanna go in and update the location code um, on several items that already exist. Like, and I believe I mentioned this before, like I said, you want to use, um, you can use the export grid items option on that transaction grid, for example, um, the items grid. And when you do that, you want to choose the Excel file type in order to retain those leading zeros and commas and stuff like that we were talking about earlier. Um, so when you go in, um, you know, you filter on the items grid. When you select the ones, the transactions that you want to update, when you do that, no matter what columns you have on your grid, it's going to pull all fields, not just the ones showing on your grid. It's going to pull all the fields, like, for example, on the items record. And those will all be in the spreadsheet. So, um, when doing that, um, you just want to be aware of that. And it's also going to provide a column called ID. And that is going to have some kind of a long number on there um, that is something that needs to be, that needs to stay in there because it will be used when you update those existing items. So if you see, you know, you're pulling the items grid and you're doing an extract, and you see the, the tag number as the first column, and then you see an ID column with a long number um, that goes down that column, don't remove it, don't delete it, don't be changing things in there, leave that go. Um, and then when you actually make you know, the other changes like changing your location codes, then when you save that spreadsheet and load it back in, you're going to say update existing items, it's gonna use that ID column in order to find the proper item and load that in. So, so it is needed when you're updating existing items. Um, when importing an updated spreadsheet, one other thing you wanna make note of is that all column data on your spreadsheet will overwrite the existing data in inventory. So if you are updating your replacement costs and you have um, 5,000 on your spreadsheet, um, so you've updated it from 4,500 to 5,000. Obviously, when you import that back in, whatever's sitting in that cell on the spreadsheet is going to overwrite the existing value in the application. So now the new replacement cost is going to show 4,500. It's not going to be in addition to or subtracted. It's going to totally overwrite it. 
So one thing you want to keep in mind is, like I said, when you export out of inventory, it pulls all fields. And so if you are only changing like the replacement cost or just the location categories and numbers, you're just doing that, leave all the other data alone. Um, so for any columns where you're not making changes, it's going to show all of that in the spreadsheet. Um, leave it alone. You don't have to remove those columns if you don't want to. What's going to happen then is, you know, you go in, make the proper changes you need, um, like for the location codes, um, your column, and then save it, reload it in, and it just basically goes in and it's going to update everything. Um, but those are the same values that were extracted out, right? So for those columns, you didn't make any changes to. So those same values are going to go back in. So it's not going to make any changes per se on those columns where you didn't make a change on the actual spreadsheet. Um, so down here, I just have a little note here, this last bullet. So for data that has not been changed on your spreadsheet, leave it as is. Um, do not remove the values or purposely leave only the headers on there and clear out the data underneath it. Or guarantee you go back in to import that spreadsheet, it's going to see the column header. It's going to say, oh, it's all blank. And it will clear out the entire values in there. So, um, so it's going to import it with that blank data. So just leave it go. Or if you want to, um, and you're nervous about it, you can delete you know, the entire column and header from uh, the spreadsheet so that none of that data gets imported back in. Um, but I think it's just easier just to leave it go and it will import the same way as it came out. So, okay, I'm gonna end to that and I'm gonna go back in to the system. First off, I'm gonna talk about the chapter. So I'm gonna go into our user manual and I'm going underneath system and it is going to be the import option in here. So this contains all of the um, specs, everything um, in regards to importing in an open period. And so in here, here are all of the different things that you can import. Um, asset class codes, category codes, condition codes. So these are the core codes that can be imported in, but there's also um, actual transaction data, dispositions, acquisitions, and items. Those are the three transaction-based spreadsheets that you can um, import in. So I'm just gonna go down to the item one, just to show you these are the file specs. Now, like I said, each of these transaction based have an actual item spreadsheet. So if you're starting new, so you've got a bunch of laptops that you want to um, import in and mass create items for, um, you can use this spreadsheet, download the spreadsheet. It's got all the proper formatting in here. Um, and you can compare that maybe to a spreadsheet that you have of those laptops and just make sure the formatting is the same. And down here, it contains all the different formatting and all of the um, fields that are actually required to. So those are noted in bold. Um, so as long as you know, you've know you got everything in the right format, um, you know one thing you wanna be careful of is if your asset classes are you know, 0300, you've got a zero in front of that 300, you wanna make sure that they're showing as 0300 on your column or else if it's just 300 they're going to import that way um, and it's going to create an asset class if it does if it isn't already out there for 300 so um, you just want to be very careful and that template spreadsheet provides the formatting but again it's all explained in here as well so you just need to take a little time to kind of look through this um, and just make sure that your spreadsheet is formatted properly um, some of the things, or a couple of things I wanna point out underneath the item spreadsheet, and I apologize for scrolling, is that remember on my slide when I said um, that you can go in and mass update stuff mostly? 
Um, the life to date depreciation is something that um, we do have a note here is when it comes to um, user, um, that user import, um, it isn't really recommended to use um, this when importing um, updating life to date depreciation values. Um, it's because we created those depreciation adjustments, and we'll talk about this more on Friday. Um, we created those depreciation adjustment transactions that it kind of makes it a little difficult to do it in here. Um, but um, so that's one field I would be kind of cautious on is updating life to date via spreadsheet. I would use the depreciate option instead on the items grid to calculate depreciation, or I would post a depreciation adjustment um, within the item to make a change. Um, so doing it via spreadsheet, via the system, import is not recommended. And we have a note here that this field can only be imported via spreadsheet when you're using the system configuration migration import um, option. Another thing too, when it comes to beginning balance, um, again, this is something that is not gonna be recognized when you're doing a system import. Um, this will only be used when you're doing the migration import um, because when you're importing those archived period items, you need to set up those beginning balances. So again, Something we'll get into later. I think we're, you know, we're gonna have a session here um, later on this year talking about the migration imports. And so everything else is kind of laid out. Here's the acquisition import type here. Goes into this as well with the spreadsheet. So you can go in and mass create additional acquisitions to existing items. Items have to exist first in order to use this. Um, so these are all the different formats and stuff. So we've got them for all the transaction based. And then, like I said, we've got the templates for the codes too, the core menu codes. Okay. I think I'm gonna go through just a quick example of one here. Um, I think I might just to save us some time instead of going through the grids. Um, I've got a spreadsheet that I extracted using the Excel option out of the items grid. And I'm gonna pull it into Excel here. And so um, what I did is I filtered by a specific location. And here is my location number and my location category here. And so what I want to do is you'll notice too that, you know, I extracted this out of the items grid, filtered it by that location. So I only have about 28 of them. Um, and here is that ID field I was talking about that we just leave alone. Um, we can leave everything else alone too. All we really want to do is go in and change these two fields. And so my location category, I want to change it to is make these a little bit bigger. So here's my location number. Here's my location category. So I want this to be B106. And basically I'm going to copy that and paste it down here. And then I want the location number to be 0001. And you'll notice when I did that, that um, because I pulled it from the um, extract on the grid, um, the format of the location number is no longer a text format. And so that's okay. What I'm gonna do is just change this to text. And then I'm gonna go ahead and copy that, paste it in the next one. And so I've got my location category, my location number. I'm leaving everything else as is. I'm not going to touch it. It's going to go in, import in exactly as it went out. 
So I'm not going to be changing anything over here, um, any of my codes or anything. So I'll go ahead and I will save this. And I can save it first as an Excel format in case I need to make more changes. I think that's the, the wisest thing to do. Um, but now I'm ready to actually go in and import it back in. So I'm gonna go up to file, save as, and I'm gonna change it to a CSV format. And now when I go in, to my application here, and I go into import, and it's the items information. I pull it from the items grid. I'm just updating the location is all. And um, what I wanna make sure is I go ahead and upload the file that I just saved. And it's in CSV format and it's items type. And I wanna make sure that it says update records and updating. I don't have new ones. These are existing records. I'm going to leave everything else. I don't need to create transfer transactions. I didn't change anything on the asset class funding function. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on import. And it's gonna create an import results file. And I didn't try this out ahead of time, so <laughs> it works. And so this is what it should show. It should show that the item's been updated, the tag number, and it shows the description. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick on one of these 00120 and go to the item grid. And it should show the new location, which was B106001. So that's a, a quick way to go in and mass update locations. Extract it out, change it, and import it back in. Okay, any questions about that? All right, I went way over today, I'm so sorry. I had a feeling the first one was going to be a little bit longer. Um, but if you guys don't have any other questions, um, tomorrow we're going to go over the inventory reports. We're gonna go in and go into the gap related ones, the non-gap, talk about the fiscal year and report bundle and go through some uh, demo demonstration uh, demonstrations on generating these reports. Um, and just getting you guys more familiar with what's on the report, especially the gap ones, getting you more comfortable with that. All right. If you guys don't have any other questions here, you guys have a great rest of your day and we will see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.